Yeah, in, in Tokyo in 1996. That's a pretty good record if you think about it. Just two in the history of the modern world. And the reason that there have not been more of them is because the global rules of the war, war, road banning those work. And we need to strengthen them and reconsider our own um, policies on nuclear weapons as well. Uh, lastly, I'll end here. Um, we need to do a much better job of managing globalization. You can't walk around Cleveland without seeing the effects of globalization. Manufacturing jobs are gone. The service sectors are up. Uh, the future of Cleveland here is the service sector, the health sector, uh, banking, insurance. Um, not the manufacturing steel plant. Uh, you've lost most of your steel plants in manufacturing. Um, and that's not going to change. But it's awful for the communities that it affects. Um, in the book, we talk about you know, members of my own family that have had their jobs moved to China. And, and they want to put walls up around America. They want to stop globalization. They want to stop trade. That's not the answer. But the answer isn't just to willy-nilly tear down barriers and have trade so that more communities, like the ones here in Cleveland, are affected. You have to have a much stronger visionary leader who understands the need to take care of those communities that are affected, do a better job in the environment and labor. Uh, the collapse of this Doha round earlier this week, which was the next round of global trade negotiations that was designed to bring down the agricultural barriers, is going to be one of the biggest challenges for the next president. And whether it's Obama or, or McCain, I think they'll need to address it and, and put forward American um, leadership. Um, so that's kind of a rich menu to choose from. Uh, it's much easier if you can come up here and say, here's the one thing that will solve all of our crises. Um, there isn't, but I try and put it in a broad framework with American leadership leading on this myriad of challenges, regaining our support, and those long list of scary things I put forward at the beginning of my talk this morning or this afternoon uh, will begin to get better. So let me thank you again for the wonderful visit here and take some questions. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to Ambassador Nancy Soderberg, author of The Prosperity Agenda, What the World Wants from America, and What We Need in Return. We will return to our speaker in just a minute for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and hopefully to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPM 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many, many radio stations across the country. Radio broadcasts of the City Club are made possible through the generous support of Case Western Reserve University. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ, PBS IdeaStream, and Time Warner Cable. Television broadcasts are supported by National City and Cleveland State University. Our live webcasts are supported by the University of Akron. We are pleased to welcome our programming partners, the Cleveland chapter of the National Security Network, and guests at a table hosted by Baker and Hostetler. Thank you for joining us today. Now, we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone including guests, and holding the microphones today are City Club Outreach Coordinator Deborah Agosti and intern Kim Leary. Now, first question, please. Uh, Ambassador uh, Soddenberg, you spoke about the uh, fact that opinion throughout the world is turning against America. Uh, to what extent do you think that's due to our uh, failure to uh, uh, speak eloquently or positively about the, about the environment, uh, our failure to uh, endorse the Kyoto Principle, uh, which most nations of the world did endorse, uh, our failure to even acknowledge such a thing as global warming, and as a, as a, uh, as a uh, post, postscript to that question, which one of the two political parties do you think would be uh, most successful in addressing that issue and perhaps uh, restoring uh, our favorable opinion throughout the world? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, on the, um, I'll preface this with this is a nonpartisan forum, so I'll keep it um, as nonpartisan as I can I can be. Um, on the question of the environment and, and anti-Americanism, the the spike in anti-Americanism, uh, the polls show it's much broader than the issue of global warming. 
Um, it is uh, primarily the invasion of Iraq, the rejection of the rest of the world's views on that, the shunning aside of the UN, the rejection of the International Criminal Court, the pictures, uh, which was an aberration of Americans' values, and but it's still those pictures of Abu Ghraib live in the internet world of those who are trying to promote anti-Americanism. Um, it's the, the failure to really support uh, democracy around the world, to go into Egypt and talk about democracy and then not follow up with it. Um, so it's a whole range of issues that's been uh, going on, I think, has has promoted this anti-Americanism. And, and of course, there's anti-Americanism in all of our history. But if you look at the polls, and for those of you who are interested in this, I think the, the, the Pew polls um, are probably the, the most uh, comprehensive on this. It is unprecedented levels of anti-Americanism at unprecedented rates. Um, and it's a huge problem. Uh, so what I argue is we need to change the way the world perceives the United States right now. And it's just not that hard to do. The world gets it when we change our policies and get it right. And I think whether it's an Obama or a McCain, that, that, that has already, that, in fact, it already has started to change. President Bush, after saying he wouldn't negotiate with North Korea, or Iran is doing both. He's starting to try and get the rest of the world involved in the Iraq solution. He's beginning to negotiate with partners, uh, listen a little bit. Um, they're actually even starting to shift a little bit on the on the global warming issue. The latest um, the latest meeting a couple months ago, they at least admitted it was a problem. Um, so I, I think either way, the next administration is going to shift the range of issues that have spiked up this anti-Americanism. Um, as far as which political party would, would provide a uh, stronger solution to the issue of global warming, I think if you look at the, the differences between the Democrats and the Republicans, they're fairly stark on this issue. Um, President Bush was perhaps on the extreme side of the Republican um, Party, but um, generally the, the policies promoted by General uh, by by, in general, by President Bush and Republicans tend to uh, question the science more, not willing to put mandatory caps on, um, wanting things to be voluntary. Um, Democrats tend to recognize that in order for something to actually have an implementable benchmarks and have an impact, it has to be mandatory. So the big debate is going to be, is it going to be mandatory? Are you going to have set caps? Um, and how to get China, but both parties agree you need to get China and India into the next deal. They are now, China is now surpassed as, as the biggest polluter on earth and they have to be part of the next deal, which will require some major negotiations. Um, Ambassador, I wonder if you could comment on uh, the situation in Zimbabwe and specifically um, uh, that being a country that um, for the U.S. has less strategic um, and economic relevance than other parts of the world. and. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, and also, um, in the National Security Council, our inability to get um, China and Russia to sort of join us. You know, a country like Zimbabwe, and I think it's a good marker for other um, nations around the world where um, we do have an interest, but it's not as strong as others. How do we, have we lost our influence um, to such a point that we can't um, get others to sort of join us? And clearly, of a situation where an election was stolen from a, um, a democratically elected new leader. For those of you who may not be following the crisis in Zimbabwe as closely as, as Michael is, um, what's happened in Zimbabwe is uh, an effort by Robert Mugabe, who's been president for 30 years, uh, to, to remain in power by playing the race card, by trying to retake the land from the whites and, and basically uh, repress and, and imprison his opposition in order for him to stay in power. Um, he was one of the great liberation heroes in the 1960s, um, but he has turned his back on democracy um, at great expense to the country's prosperity. Um, the opposition leader, Morgan Transvi, actually won the election a few months ago, but not by enough to uh, avoid a runoff. And they agreed to have a runoff, and Robert Mugabe sent his thugs out to beat up, kill, and imprison, uh, and, and harass the opposition to the point where the opposition candidate said, I'm not going to have lives at risk here, and he refused to participate. Um, I look at actually this as a challenge for the African leaders to take on. Um, we have interest in Zimbabwe, certainly. Um, the, we, the U.S. did take a resolution to this U.N. Security Council, and China and Russia vetoed it.